Biggest Panda aims at being all the car some buyers will ever need. It's large where it matters, yet still small enough for its urban purpose. It's more efficient, especially in its latest 1 litre mild hybrid form, and very manoeuvrable. It can even head off-road in 4x4 form. You can make it trendy, or specify one that's super affordable. Italians have always done this kind of thing very well. They still do. Almost every car you can think of on the market can be pigeonholed into a specific market segment. And even if it can't be, it's likely to appeal to a very specific group of customers. In many ways, the Fiat Panda's different. And here, with this latest mild hybrid version, we're going to find out why. Although sized and priced as a little city car, it's so versatile and classless that it can really function as, well, almost anything you like. Uh, depending on the flavour you choose, it's a design as suited to city living as it is to the needs of a mountaintop farmer. It can be eco-conscious transport for friends of the earth, perhaps a second vehicle for older empty nesters, or the sole car for a rural family. Less a city car and more an essential car. It is, in the words of one top Fiat executive, the official car for doing whatever the hell you like. This is the Italian brand at its very best. A modern era Mark II Panda design was launched back in 2003 to replace a first generation model that sold for over 20 years from 1980. The Mark III design we have here was originally launched back in 2011, but in early 2020, it was significantly updated with the option of one litre mild hybrid power. And it's this improved Panda that we're gonna take a look at here functional, solid, intelligent and free-spirited. It's still, we're told, a car that thinks outside the box. Let's try it. You'll need to be happy to buck the trend if you choose your small Fiat as a Panda rather than as a 500. The exterior packaging couldn't be more different, but as ever, the engineering is just the same, including the provision of the mild hybrid one litre petrol engine that we're trying here. At the time of this test in autumn 2020, uh, older power plants did still feature in the range, but going forward, this electrified three-cylinder unit uh, is one that the brand plans to concentrate on for Panda buyers. Shouldn't a car that thinks outside the box have an engine designed to do just the same? Well, yeah, Fiat thinks so. Now, we've seen this Firefly one litre engine with its two valves per cylinder layout before in a couple of FCA Group small SUVs, the Fiat 500X and the Jeep Renegade. In the form used in the 500 and in this Panda though, it's a bit different. It lacks a turbocharger, but it gains a 12 volt belt starter generator known as a BSG, along with an 11 amp hour lithium ion battery, the major components of the mild hybrid system that the badging of the car now loudly trumpets. In many ways, that's a bit misleading. There's nothing remotely Prius-like about this car. I mean, you can't drive it solely on its battery. You certainly can't plug it in. And there's no clever transmission like, say, the clutchless dog box auto, a Renault Clio hybrid. In fact, if you came to this car, as many will, fresh from a version of this Fiat with the old 1.2 litre, four cylinder, 69 HP engine, which at the time of this test was still continuing with the standard shape version of this model, you'd probably hardly notice any differences at all. Even the 70 HP output of the new power plant is virtually the same as that older 1.2 litre unit. Uh, and the performance stats rest to 62 and allegedly 14.7 seconds en route to an academic maximum of 96 miles an hour, they're much the same too. There's not much more pulling power either, just 92 newton meters of it, which means you'll often have to thrash the car along a bit to make meaningful progress. Although the three-cylinder power plant's rumbly roar when you do that is actually quite characterful. Still, be all that as it may, what's happening beneath the bonnet as you drive is all very different, as the instrument binnacle displays selectable battery hybrid readout seems to suggest. 
as is the case with all mild hybrid units, like for example the one that Ford now uses in the Fiesta, the belt starter generator harvests energy during braking and deceleration and stores it in the system's little integrated battery so it can be used in one of two ways, either to aid acceleration or to power the car's auxiliaries as the engine stop-start system activates when you're waiting at the lights or in a traffic queue. Uh, there'll never be enough charge generated to power the car without the aid of its combustion unit and even if there was the battery wouldn't be big enough to store it. What this is then is less a hybrid power plant and more an embellishment to combustion engineering which boosts efficiency by up to 30% in terms of CO2 emissions according to Fiat. Having crunched the stats since the last time we tested this car back in 2011, we're struggling to see that and we've certainly found it difficult to discern much of the promised benefits in enhanced acceleration. But then we've also found that with all the recent mild hybrid models that we've tested. There is a reason why full hybrid tech, uh, such as you'll find on a Toyota Yaris for example, or that Clio hybrid model just mentioned, cost a lot more. The only other powertrain option in this Panda is the 0.9 litre two-cylinder petrol twin-air uh, 85 horsepower turbo unit that features in the two four-wheel drive variants at the top of the range. It doesn't have much more pulling power than this mild hybrid unit, just 145 newton meters of it, but it's certainly a little better able to keep the Panda up with the traffic flow. Uh, so equipped, a four-wheel drive version of this Fiat makes 62 in 12.7 seconds on the way to 102 miles an hour. The 4x4 system is one of those torque-on-demand setups which essentially means that the car will always be front-driven unless slippery conditions require that uh, drive to the rear wheels also be brought into play, uh, which then happens automatically without the need for any driver input. Off the beaten track, a properly specified four-wheel drive Panda can potentially embarrass a lot of compact SUVs you'd expect to cope far better. After all, the maximum angle of gradient that an all-wheel driven Panda can approach without any part of the bodywork touching the ground is 20 degrees. The maximum departure angle or angle of gradient from which it can drive away without touching the ground is 36 degrees. And its breakover angle at the top of the hill is 20 degrees. If you're ever going to be putting any of that to the test, then you'll need to have ignored the standard body shape Panda 4x4 model and instead uh, chosen the meteor looking Panda Cross 4x4 variant. Only the top model gets 4x4 rear differential lock and an all-terrain selector switch offering three modes, auto, off-road and hill descent control. Quite a few Panda buyers would like the Cross 4x4 version's purposeful looks, but few of them actually need its off-road capability, which is why an increasing number of customers uh, opt for the front-driven City Cross derivative, uh, like the one we're trying here actually. From the launch of this mild hybrid engine, it was this version of the Panda that you had to have to get the electrified unit. In front-driven form, this Fiat is of course primarily designed for the urban jungle, hence the City button on the fascia, which lightens steering feel at parking speeds. For urban use we'd still find the manual gearbox which has five speeds on the 1.2 but offers six on this mild hybrid variant uh, rather bulky although in this hybrid model as I said it does now have six rather than five ratios. It is a bit awkward to try to get it to reverse too. Out of town, this Panda feels rather less in its element. Uh, elements of the chassis date back to the second generation model of 2003, and you uh, feel that in various ways. The suspension allows low speed bumps to be felt and heard rather too often, plus the steering offers little feedback when you're pressing on across twistier routes. And through those turns, the softish setup of this fit means that you'll uh, get quite a bit more body roll than you would in most city car rivals. Still, loyal Panda customers tend to forgive this car a lot for its friendly looks, spacious cabin, cheeky engine note and turn on a sixpence manoeuvrability. There's a super tight 9.1 metre turning circle, plus it helps enormously that the high driving position and the big windows make this car easy to place on the road when you're jinking through town centre traffic. It's urban friendly through and through.
In many ways, the Panda has been one of the most influential car designs we've seen this century. The Mark II version of 2003 redefined just how versatile a small car could be, and those were qualities usefully evolved by this third generation car eight years later. Today, customers tend to want their small runabouts with trendier packaging, which is why an increasing number of Panda buyers want this more fashionably presented cross version with its SUV style front spot lamps and its more prominent under bumper sections. Whatever form of Panda meets your fancy, it'll come with what Fiat hopes is a friendly look, and that's based on what the Italian brand's designers call a squarical theme. Rounded rectangles invoke everywhere from the headlamps to the front air intake, uh, from the wheel arches to that trademark extra third rearward side window. There is something of a feeling of a tiny MPV about this model, something that was carried over from the old second generation version. It remains a tall car with a vertical tail, a five door only shape and a large glass area, bigger than that pre-2011 Mark II predecessor, slightly longer, wider and taller, but sat on the same wheelbase, so the roadway footprint remains satisfyingly tiny, despite an 82mm length increase over a comparable Fiat 500. Black roof rails, they're standard on most models, and the car sits on wheels that are either 14 or, as in this case, 15 inches in size. That vertical tailgate is another indispensable part of the Panda theme. Uh, the hatch glass flanked by high set tail lamps and lower reflectors inserted into the bumper corners, either side of this ribbed lower trim section that flows up towards the tailgate opening. The underpinnings, of course, are pretty ancient, but this car does remain notably light, weighing in at well under a ton. Let's take a look inside. At the wheel, it's all very functional and very noughties. This must be one of the very last new cars on sale without any sort of center dash infotainment screen. Uh, back in 2011, when this Mark III design was first launched, the bright orange LED graphics of the audio cluster and the instrument binnacle screen looked pretty up to date. Now they remind you what small car cabins used to feel like. Still, you might quite like the slightly retro feel that all that delivers. It's hard to imagine any other small hatch created in the 21st century's first decade, still being able to carry this kind of design off 10 years on, but the Panda just about manages it. Part of the reason why is that it still feels a little quirky and fun. It helps that those squarical touches we mentioned continue on inside. You'll find them in the instrument binnacle gauges, the A-pillar speakers here, uh, on the steering wheel boss, on the fascia button clusters, and in the shaping of the gear knob, the cup holders, and the door handles. On the seats of cheaper versions, there are also embossed squarical dimples that better help air circulate between your body and the backrest. Uh, the dashboard here, meanwhile, is enveloped in a colourful frame of your choosing with a roomy storage pocket right in front of the front passenger, supposed to evoke a nod towards uh, original 80s Panda motoring. Now that really was basic, although for its time, the Mark I model was undeniably clever with seats that could be uh, removed completely and also washed or kept in and turned into a double bed. Talking of storage areas, there are quite a few of them. Uh, Fiat says there are actually 14 different receptacles of various kinds. You get a decently large glove box, plus cup holders and a 12 volt socket between the seats, along with recessed cubbies at the handbrake and under the bottom of the center stack. You also get ticket clips on the sun visors and very narrow door pockets, each with an integrated bottle holder. Another recess can be found beneath this phone cradle, which could allow your handset to act as an infotainment screen and which decorates the top of the dashboard, incorporating a USB port. Pay extra for a comfort kit and you can add in a coat hook, a height adjustable seat belts and a driver's side sunglasses holder. 
The branded seats we've got here with that eye-catching rib design are reasonably comfortable. On this particular variant, the uh, upholstery has been fashioned from what's called sequel yarn. That's derived from recycled plastic, 10% of which originates from the sea and 90% from the land. Uh, to create this special material, plastic rubbish is reduced to flakes of polyethylene terephthalate, which are then spun into the yarn from which the fabric's made, alongside other natural recycled or recovered fibres. That all rather fits with the eco-hybrid theme. We also like the high set fascia mounted manual gear stick and the superb all round visibility which is excellent thanks to the squared off glassy body shape. Not so good is the fact that the steering adjusts only for height and not for reach, a particular issue in the very base variant which doesn't offer a height adjustable driver's seat that we have here. Uh, obviously all the plastics are of the hard, scratchy sort, but build quality from the Naples production plant, unlike the 500, the Panda is actually built in Italy, does seem sound. That orange lit audio control cluster we mentioned in the centre of the fascia doesn't offer much functionality apart from Bluetooth connectivity, not even a DAB radio unless you pay extra, which does seem rather astonishing in this day and age. Uh, the visually crowded little screen between the two dimly lit instrument styles, that doesn't offer much extra in terms of features either, although from it uh, you can select a display that shows the current state of the hybrid battery. And in the back, well, thanks to the slim seats, rear seat passenger space is perfectly adequate for a couple of fully sized adults. It really feels old school to find wind up windows back here, but there's plenty on the plus side. The low glassy waistline means that kids will be better able to see out and may, as a result, be less likely to be car sick. Plus, the central transmission tunnel is notably low, so if you absolutely had to fit three adults back here, you absolutely could. All of them would have enough ceiling space too to wear elaborate headgear should a wedding visit be on the agenda. On that ceiling, by the way, the squarical theme continues courtesy of these three dimples. Bear in mind that if you do want the option to seat three people back here, you'll have to pay extra for a third centre seat belt with the standard shape model. Uh, this cross variant though gets that as standard. Uh, that third belt comes with these hard black plastic rear head restraints which dig uncomfortably into your back until you raise them up. Uh, rear grab handles cost extra and there's not a lot of room to put things, plus there are no seat back pockets and the door bins, well they're tiny but you do get these little recesses in the door pulls and you can access a couple of cup holders in this storage tray here between the front seats. Let's finish with a look in the boot. Uh, on the way though, comment on the fact that there's no filler cap. Instead, you have a fuel filler pipe which opens and closes automatically when the pump's inserted and withdrawn. It won't allow petrol to be pumped into a diesel car or vice versa. Lift this light tailgate and you'll find that this trunk area is a reasonable 225 litres in size, plus it's square and usefully shaped. And you get this useful pull down tire to close the hatch. There's quite a high lip to access the space though, and there's no real room beneath the boot floor to store anything else, although a space saver spare can be fitted down here if you pay extra for it. You get a bag hook on the right, and with most variants, you get this boot light on the left. With the standard shape model, you have to pay extra for this 60-40 split rear seat. This cross variant gets that as standard. Uh, fold the rear bench down and you'll free up 870 litres of space. Unfortunately, there's no longer the option of a fold flat front passenger seat to extend that further. There are two Panda body styles, the standard one and this more crossover orientated cross variant. At the time of this test in autumn 2020, front driven cross variants like this one had to have the new three cylinder mild hybrid petrol power plant with that electrified engine also available with the mid range easy spec version of the standard body shape. Fiat's plan is clearly to broaden availability of that electrified unit and eventually to use it to replace the ancient 1.2 litre, 69 horsepower, four cylinder petrol engine that at the time of this test still continued on in some other standard shape models. 
Prices for that standard version of this five-door only design start at around £10,500 and even with plush trim, mid-range easy spec and that fresh mild hybrid engine, a standard shape Panda model will give you plenty of change from £12,000. To give you some perspective, those figures mean you'll be saving more than £2,000 over an equivalent base spec Fiat 500 hybrid. Is a more fashionable look really worth paying such a premium for? Only you can decide. And also there's the issue that the Fiat 500 only comes with three doors. One thing's for certain, the cost of fashion has never been more evident. It's not as if this Panda can't be fashionable itself. It is in this trendy cross form anyway, with its roof bars, 15 inch off-road style alloy wheels, prominent front fog lights, body colored side moldings and front and rear body colored skid plates. The base City Cross variant that most Panda customers choose is around £14,000 and that gets you that new mild hybrid engine. The same sum, by the way, wouldn't even get you two trim levels up the Fiat 500 ownership ladder. We should also mention that there's no option for the dual logic semi-automatic transmission that you can still have on the Fiat 500. The Panda is manual only these days with five speeds in the 1.2 litre variant and six in this mild hybrid model. Uh, we additionally need to brief you on the fact that both the standard and the cross Panda ranges are topped off by desirable 4x4 models. Fiat hasn't yet worked out how to mate the mild hybrid engine with its all-wheel drive drivetrain. So both those flagship 4x4 derivatives continue on with the innovative two-cylinder twin air 85 horsepower 0.9 litre turbo power plant which has been offered in the Panda for most of the last decade. At the time of this test, Fiat wanted around £15,500 for the standard model 4x4 and just over £17,000 for the all-wheel drive cross version. The only direct segment rival for these 4x4 Pandas is the top all-grip version of Suzuki's Ignis, but that costs more than both versions of this Fiat. Front-driven Pandas obviously have a bit more competition, but not as much as you might think. In recent times, Vauxhall, Ford, Renault and Skoda have all pulled out of the city car market, and both Seat and Smart products in this segment can no longer be had with a combustion engine. Uh, that leaves only the Kia Picanto and the Hyundai uh, i10. They share the same engineering. And the single design that we know as either a Peugeot 108, a Citroen C1 or a Toyota iGo. This Panda looks competitive with all those products we just mentioned on price. If you want an affordable city car with a bit of a crossover look, like this Panda Cross, then your only other option is the X-Line version of the Kia Picanto. Ultimately though, there's nothing quite like this Fiat, and if you've come to that conclusion, then you're going to need to know just how generous Fiat has been with the standard specification. So let's start by looking at the standard shape model range. Uh, now that begins with the base pop trim. That includes only the very basics, although these days Fiat does uh, throw in air conditioning. There's not much more with mid-range easy trim, which at the time of this test, as mentioned earlier, was the standard shape Panda model you had to have if you wanted the newer mild hybrid engine. Easy spec includes roof rails, a height adjustable driver's seat and rear head restraints. Plusher lounge spec is better equipped still with 15 inch alloy wheels, front fog lights, powered mirrors, Bluetooth and leather for the steering wheel and the gear knob. Uh, the spec of the standard 4x4 model that is based on lounge trim with the addition of 4x4 styling, raised suspension and of course the 4x4 drivetrain. If you'd prefer this cross body style, specification is rather higher across the board. Uh, we mentioned the cross variant's exterior embellishments earlier, and to this, uh, the base version adds automatic climate control, a height adjustable driver's seat, uh, a leather covered steering wheel, and a four speaker Bluetooth radio with a smartphone cradle too. Uh, plusher variants, those are offered 
further up the range with unique trim. Now at the time of this test, for example, Fiat was offering this launch edition variant, which has special sequel uh, recycled upholstery uh, and a dew green dashboard. Uh, there was also a trendy Trisadi variant with cafe colouring for the dash and for the white stitched upholstery. Uh, if you want a panda that really can walk the walk as well as talk the talk though, then the top cross 4x4 will appeal, a variant that really does visually set itself apart with a really unique ultra shine silver finish for the bumpers, for the side mouldings and for the roof bars, plus a brilliant red finish for the front tow hooks. It also gets a more capable standard of all-wheel drive engineering with rear differential gear locking and an all-terrain selector switch which offers three modes, auto, off-road and hill descent control. On to options. Uh, why in this day and age Fiat doesn't include a DAB radio as standard on any version of this car unless you pay extra is a mystery to us. And it's disappointing that on the standard shape models you have to pay extra for a third rear seat belt and a split folding rear bench. Across the range you can add an extra cost comfort kit which includes rear grab handles, a coat hook, height adjustable front seat belts and a driver's side sunglasses holder. All pandas but the base trim standard model can also be ordered with a winter pack and that'll give you a heated windscreen and heated front seats. For mid-range variants there is an optional comfort pack uh, which gives you powered heated door mirrors and rear parking sensors. Or you could choose the optional safety pack which includes those two features plus city brake control, autonomous braking. Other popular extras include a space saver spare wheel, a heated windscreen and rear parking sensors. In addition you can add in things like roof rails, front fog lights and climate control if the Panda variant that you've chosen doesn't have them. Now you will probably be paying your Fiat dealer more for your choice of paint colour, the pastel shade of ambient white, that's the only one that comes as standard. There are various extra cost special and metallic colours, we've got dew green here. If you really want to stand out though, there's a Tropicalia yellow special finish and dark tinted rear windows, they're optional too. If you've chosen the entry level City Cross model, then you'll be offered a City Cross style pack that gives you body coloured door mirrors, red front hooks and an ultra shine silver finish for the skid plates, the side mouldings and the roof bars, along with special interior cross upholstery and a copper coloured dashboard. On to safety. Now given the age of this design you wouldn't expect to find any of the latest electronic camera based features that are now creeping onto rival models so it's a pleasant surprise to find that unlike on a mild hybrid Fiat 500 city brake control autonomous braking can be optioned in either on its own or as part of the safety pack we mentioned earlier. We're rather less impressed that you have to pay extra for side airbags on the standard shape model. Uh, twin front and curtain bags are of course standard across the range but you can't have the driver's knee bag which is standard on the 500. Otherwise it's mainly just the usual passive safety stuff. There's ESC stability control plus anti-lock brakes with HBA, hydraulic brake assistance to help in panic stops and they'll be advertised to following motorists by automatically activating hazard warning lights. On top of that you get Fiat's ASR and MSR traction control systems, uh, tyre pressure monitoring and a hill holder clutch to stop you from drifting backwards on uphill junctions. Given the relatively feather light 940 kilo curb weight of this car, you might expect this Panda to be at or near the top of its class when it comes to the issue of WLTP rated running costs. Well, it certainly doesn't do too badly when in this cross spec form it's fitted with the mild hybrid 1 litre Firefly 3 cylinder petrol engine that we're trying here. This power plant's electrified system recovers energy during braking and deceleration and stores it in a lithium ion battery with a capacity of 11 amp hours and uses it to restart the engine in stop and start mode and to assist it during acceleration. This technology allows the internal combustion engine to switch off at speeds below 18 miles an hour. 
Uh, the mild hybrid propulsion unit works with a six-gear manual transmission aimed at improving fuel economy in out-of-town driving, and that's thanks to new low-friction bearings and gaskets and the use of a specific high-efficiency lubricant. A selectable battery indicator at the top of the central instrument cluster screen can brief you on hybrid system battery use. Fiat reckons its electrified mild hybrid technology can improve emissions by up to 30%, but that's difficult for us to verify because the industry has switched to a different WLTP system for rating emissions since the last time we tested this car. The actual quoted figure is up to 126 grams per kilometer. Combined cycle fuel economy is quoted at up to 50.4 mpg. That certainly isn't a 30% improvement. For reference, the figures for the standard shape Panda variant using this mild hybrid engine are slightly better, uh, up to 52.3 mpg on the combined cycle and up to 122 grams per kilometer, which is virtually the same as is quoted for the 500 mild hybrid model we tested recently, which quotes at 53.3 mpg and 119 grams per kilometer. This standard of running cost efficiency would of course be too much to ask of the ancient 8 valve 1.2 litre 69 brake horsepower 4 cylinder petrol engine that at the time of this test in autumn 2020 was still being used on the standard shape Panda models. This delivers up to 44.1 mpg on the combined cycle and up to 132 grams per kilometre of CO2. To give you some perspective on those readings, a rival 1.2 litre Hyundai i10 or Kia Picanto manages about 52 miles per gallon and about 125 grams per kilometre of CO2. For completion, we'll also give you the figures for the Panda 4x4 variants. They also use an older Fiat engine, but a rather better one. The brand's 0.9 litre, two-cylinder twin-air turbo petrol unit, which some years ago replaced the 1.3 litre multi-jet diesel that's now long forgotten for Fiat Panda buyers. In this twin-air petrol form, a Panda 4x4 manages 37.7 mpg, 37.2 for the cross 4x4 and up to 166 six grams per kilometer of CO2. What else? Um, insurance. Well, pop and lounge versions of the standard shape model, they're rated at a very affordable Group 3, with a Group 4 rating applicable for easy spec. For reasons that we find hard to understand, this cross variant is rated much higher, Group 6 for all front-driven variants. Uh, the standard shape 4x4 model is rated at Group 7, the cross 4x4 at Group 10. Service intervals are 9,000 miles or every 12 months, whichever comes around first, and that servicing needn't be too costly because Fiat parts are relatively cheap. A range of Mopar Easy Care maintenance plans uh, allow you to budget ahead for servicing costs for up to five years. Residual values there are rather better than you might expect them to be on a small, affordable Fiat, if not quite as good as you'd expect from most 500 variants. Now, the exception is the top 4x4 variants, which are very much in demand on the used market, and they hold their value superbly. What else might you need to know? Uh, well, it's disappointing that Fiat hasn't followed the lead of its brand partner Jeep in offering a five-year warranty on its cars. Uh, here you get three years, at least though it is an unlimited mileage package and it's free of the 60,000 mile limit that applies to some rivals. Now you can extend that to five years at extra cost. Plus there's 36 months of breakdown cover included as well. Loved by small car people the world over for more than 30 years, the Panda continues to define everything that a very compact, multi-purpose model should be. It's had to evolve, of course, with more efficient engines and clever technology, but its heart remains simple, functional and innovative, which is why, while other city cars will please only city car folk, you could imagine this one being bought by, well, by just about anyone. 
A few other rivals may be a little cheaper, more refined or slightly trendier, but we still think that few push the boundaries of design quite like this Fiat. It happily challenges just about every tiny car perception in the book that you can't get really impressive fuel and CO2 figures without forking out loads for a diesel, uh, that you can't seat five in this class of car or carry really large items or head for the hills in a city car. Panda people think differently thanks to a car that lets them do just that. It has got tough competition these days, no question, but in a growing segment full of talented offerings, it's a key contender that you just can't help liking.